thank you so much uh, for hosting me today. Uh, my name is Patrick, and I lead the Biomedical AI Group within uh, Glaxo Smart um, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Department. Um, the presentation I brought to you today is uh, called AI-Driven Target Validation Early Stage Drug Discovery, and is a topic near and dear to my heart, um, as it is uh, very impactful potentially uh, for discovering new medicines in the future. And so uh, one of the um, patients that I wanted to talk about a little bit today is, is really an exemplary one. Um, I think that, that shows us potentially what the impact of um, AI-driven pipelines like the one that I will be bringing to you today um, can impact. And so Hanafi here is uh, age 52, has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPT, and um, is facing a chronic, essentially a chronic inflammatory lung disease um, that is uh, associated with uh, symptoms such as difficulty breathing, cough, and mucus and is treated currently as standard of care with, three, um, with once daily triple therapy uh, consisting of an inhaled glucosteroid, a long-acting beta-2 agonist, and a long-acting uh, muscarinic uh, agonist. Uh, this particular um, therapy is an innovative one that replaced a prior dual therapy and essentially um, increased, um, uh, reduced the set of um, moderate to severe exacerbations that a patient might be facing uh, in that setting uh, by up to 15 to 25 percent. So um, we're talking about um, potential treatment escalation, hospitalization, uh, or even mortality events for some of these patients. And so as you can see from this example, a new medicine innovation has really profound and lasting impact in terms of the health and well-being um, of some of these patients that are confronted with um, these severe diseases. And so it's just one example here, um, obviously, uh, but millions of people potentially could be affected by developments of, of these new um, compounds. And so the topic that I wanted to talk to you um, about today is how we can bring more of these breakthrough medicines to patients faster using AI and machine learning. And the session today will be uh, 20 minutes long, uh, consisting of three different stages. Uh, the first one being around the problem of early target validation and why it's such a hard challenge to solve. The second part being about AI-driven target validation and how we can build an engine and a platform uh, for validating and finding the evidence um, that we need to uh, forward in the right targets um, at pace um, faster than we have in the past. What is the potential impact um, on the drug discovery pipeline? Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Uh, what is the potential impact on the drug discovery uh, pipeline um, using this approach here? And that's the third component um, that we are um, talking about. And the drug discovery process essentially um, is the following, right? So we're bringing um, this picture. Uh, where essentially we're starting out with uh, tens of thousands of uh, comp compounds here towards the left uh, in the discovery phase. Um, and this is really the starting point for all of the other phases that will follow um, going through. And so we're starting um, with tens of thousands of compounds and only 100 roughly are left as we go for um, the preclinical phase, with, which has a roughly 60% um, probability of success. Um, we then move into clinical studies with humans where we're going through phase one, phase two, phase three, um, essentially over a time period of up to 10 years uh, where we then arrive at one approved medicine out of that set of tens of thousands of compounds that we looked at initially. And there's one uh, big trend that actually is um, uh, fighting against us in this setting. Uh, it's called e rooms Law, where essentially um, uh, we're looking at an exponential drop in R&D productivity uh, that we have been observing uh, over the past uh, four decades. Um, this drop essentially has led to um, the probability of success for a new medicine being roughly 5%, and a single uh, new molecular entity essentially um, needing an average of hundreds of millions of uh, US dollars of R&D spending. And this trend was for decades exponentially worsening and has only recently started um, improving likely due to the recent emerging focus on human genetics and more targeted therapies, uh, both being areas that can be impacted quite strongly by AI-driven uh, target validation engines. And I will be bringing uh, to you closer a little bit today. And so if you think about early target validation that's actually in this pipeline, towards the very left of the pipeline. Uh, we're thinking about um, essentially uh, the first status where we're trying to identify and potentially validate um, some of the targets that are coming through the pipeline. And essentially we're trying to find those targets that have a mechanistic role in a disease relevant process and could potentially be treated um, effectively in patients. And this has significant downstream ramifications on the overall probability of success as this is the input to all of the following subsequent stages. And so this could potentially preempt expensive late stage failures if we do a better job in this first initial stage um, using potentially a machine learning and data driven approach. And so some of the tools and that we might be able to leverage for early stage 
target validation um, are listed here. Um, we're having uh, tools such as functional genomics, where we're looking at CRISPR interventions, molecular cellular systems, multi-omic technologies for reading out these systems at a high resolution, machine learning and automation uh, for essentially trying to make sense of all of this data as we're generating it, and large-scale computation and hardware for essentially um, trying to um, run this at very scale and essentially um, generating petabytes and processing petabytes of this data potentially. Uh, the second big thing that we can leverage in uh, developing these AI-driven drug discovery uh, platforms is actually the evidence that we're getting out of human genetics and population-scale biobanks, uh, where essentially people have been observing variation across hundreds of thousands of people potentially in these cohorts and trying to find out um, whether or not these risk increases uh, could correspond to better molecular entities that we could target. And so we're seeing that, um, for example, um, in some of these studies that have been reported recently, uh, that there is an up to threefold increase in probability of approval in both EU and US markets for these targets with that substantiation, potential putative causal substantiation, than those targets that do not have that uh, understanding. And so we're seeing that this could systematically um, surface uh, targets and data that might be um, relevant for disease uh, at scale. So as you can see, this, this story merge. And we can think about this as a um, AI-driven early target validation playbook, essentially, uh, where we have the AI-driven target validation toolbox that consists of CRISPR-based experimental validation, perturbation at scale, leveraging robotic automation, and then reading out and understanding this data using high-dimensional analysis and cause inference. And we can then start getting the key insight, which is uncovering the mechanisms of disease-relevant biology, and then potentially in the future uh, impacting the probability of success of these molecular targets by having that causal substantiation and that deep understanding of the molecular process that underlies these diseases and the biological mechanism behind them. And so I want to dive deeper in this, um, in this first question, which is very much around how can we leverage this experimental technology and really optimize these experimental designs to maximize the knowledge gain uh, per experiment performed in this very crucial early target validation stage. And so to do that, it can help to take a step back and think about the experimental setting that we're trying to optimize. And so on the right side here, you can see um, the actual abstract setup that we're dealing with typically. Uh, we're looking at a culture of cellular uh, molecular uh, models, uh, where essentially um, these could be corresponding to disease-relevant cell types in a disease-relevant stimulus condition, for example, in the right environmental setting. And we then try to perturb these settings systematically with uh, CRISPR interventions, for example, if you want to knock out certain genes and want to interrogate the effect of a gene on a molecular system, compared to a control setting where essentially we're not intervening on that system, and we're then comparing these two arms to each other to try to find the causal effect of that particular perturbation uh, in that system. And for example, here, uh, one of the images that I'm showing here on the screen uh, is on high content imaging on cardiomyocytes, so heart muscle cells, uh, where we have tested both a control arm as well as a retinoic acid arm, and you can see here clearly the molecular effect um, potentially of uh, retinoic acid on that um, molecular system. And so we can uh, understand here as we're doing this not just once, but potentially tens of thousands, if not millions of times, uh, we can start understanding at scale what these biological me mechanisms are and how they interact with each other and how they um, give rise potentially to disease. And so this is really about mapping out the cause effects of cellular perturbations. We can then start creating essentially a map of this. And I brought to you today an example here, a UMAP space, a two-dimensional UMAP space. Uh, we're starting on the left uh, with these experimental data points that we're collecting at a high resolution, uh, for example, using uh, high content imaging, uh, feeding them into machine learning models, and then mapping them into this um, ex uh, perturbation of space here, uh, where in red you can see the unhealthy um, target space, and then the um, uh, healthy target space, where essentially um, we try to map um, the perturbation that can move from the unhealthy to the healthy, and we can map all the different perturbations that we have tried. So I'm mapping here, for example, three perturbations, two being small molecules and one being a CRISPR knockout here. And you can see that the CRISPR knockout, for example, induces a movement in the cellular phenotype that moves from the unhealthy uh, to the healthy state. And so it could potentially uh, be an interesting medicine um, hypothesis uh, where we might be able to develop a medicine in the future uh, targeting this particular mechanism uh, to invert um, a potential unhealthy um, molecular state. So you can think about doing this not just once, but potentially um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of times, uh, using uh, robotic lab automation technologies, um, such as the ones um, that I'm showing um, uh, in this uh, picture here uh, towards the right, uh, where essentially um, uh, we're thinking about uh, running these uh, in well plates, where essentially each well plate is a single experimental condition, and we apply these with robotic technologies at scale automatically, and they both move these well plates 
as well as apply the perturbations and measure the relevant cellular parameters to generate the large-scale experimental data sets um, that, can feed, uh, that can feed our um, um, machine learning machinery essentially to find the right targets at scale. And so we're thinking about this not just um, in one uh, one-off scenario, but actually potentially running this um, in an iterative um, 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 continuous approach where essentially uh, we can systematize uh, the scientific discovery of the right targets. And so we're starting here towards the right um, with running experiments in these molecular systems and reading them out um, at high resolution. Uh, this generates experimental data that feeds into machine learning models that essentially can learn to predict what might be a good next hypothesis for testing um, in these systems. And so we could look at, for example, here towards the left, um, a gene X contributing to a disease Y, which might be a causal relationship that we might have uncovered um, in this experimental system. And so we can uh, test this experimental hypothesis in the next step again in experiments, right? So we can, uh, we can essentially say, um, please test this particular condition in that particular disease and tell me what happens. And so that is the next step of validation essentially in this loop. And this is the continuous improvement that we can then achieve potentially by running through this loop uh, multiple times over time. And so we can uh, think about this more systematically where we start potentially at an initial basic understanding here um, drawn in the bottom left, uh, where we don't know a lot about the interactions of the biological system. We don't know all of the components that are interacting even. And as we go through these cycles, um, we understand and, and learn a little bit more about the biological context uh, every time as we improve our um, data generation. And so you can see every time we do a cycle, we actually improve in the y-axis our understanding and we end up in the end uh, with a higher accuracy high fidelity model of the underlying biology, where we don't only understand the components that interact with each other, but also how we could perturb them to give rise to the right um, potential molecular phenotype. And so with every experimental iteration, we can ask new questions, get new answers, and generate a rich and high resolution understanding of the underlying disease biology. And so we've actually tested this not just in one experimental system, but across uh, many, many different uh, screen scenarios and also um, many different experimental conditions and configurations uh, that one could think about. And this was work that we've done together with uh, MIT, Oxford, and the KTH uh, in Stockholm. And this is one um, uh, setting where we essentially try to look at the cross product of the different active learning slash reinforcement learning scenarios that might be available in experimental design, where we're varying both the batch sizes, so how many experiments we're performing every single experimental cycle, the biological tasks that we look at, so T cell proliferation, prediction of R2 readouts, et cetera, and the methods that you can use for actually nominating uh, the next set of experiments to be performed uh, from random choice uh, down to um, adversarial methods here, for example. You can also think about uh, changing the types of predictors that you use to predict the potential outcomes of these experiments and the models that you use to do so. And if you look at the cross product of all of these things, uh, we tested something on the order of magnitude of a thousand different conditions uh, using a total of 20,000 CPU hours uh, in five random seats each, essentially. And the results of that you can see on, on this particular slide here, uh, where essentially on the y-axis, um, we see the number of targets that we have discovered that might move the phenotype of interest uh, to a very, very large degree. So, so uh, essentially, um, the genes and targets that move um, a potential molecular marker um, uh, uh, markedly more than, than other genes and might be potentially good targets for medicine development in the future. And uh, over time, uh, on the x-axis here, um, as we go through experimental cycles, the dots on this plot uh, we gain more understanding, we have a potential of finding more potential medicine candidates in this data set. And uh, we're testing here different scenarios, right? So we're simulating uh, what would happen if we apply different strategies for selecting these genes um, in this data set. And we're starting uh, with the different colors, the different methods um, indicated here. And we're seeing here in blue and green uh, towards the bottom, uh, the naive exploration approach, right? So we're doing a random exploration where we're just selecting out of the pool of uh, available experiments at random any that we could use. Uh, and this leads at the end towards the discovery of roughly 4% of the total pool of available discoverable uh, markers of interest. Uh, if we then look at an optimized exploration here, uh, where we're potentially looking at uh, employing um, these active learning or reinforcement learning methodologies based on machine learning models that we've trained on this data, um, we can potentially find up to 16% um, of that pool at the same amount of time, right? So we're using the same amount of experimental resources um, to essentially make more um, potential medicines um, potential medicine candidates uh, available uh, to further pro pipeline progress potentially. So this is just one example, but this second example here, for example, in natural killer cells, um, shows that this actually generalizes potentially to new biological scenarios. And I would refer you to the paper to actually look at um, potentially all of the different scenarios that we looked at, these uh, thousand different scenarios that we looked at. But here, for example, we discover after the end of the um, uh, campaign 
something like 37% uh, of the available pool of molecular targets that move the phenotype of interest in the right direction uh, versus the random choice here, for example, at the bottom again, uh, with a 13% discovery rate. So there's a variety of settings where this uh, strategy can be potentially efficacious. And we've as a next step actually asked um, the community to contribute potentially better algorithms for this setting. And this is the currently ongoing gene disco challenge um, where we kind of invite you to actually contribute your potential own challenge solution for this uh, very hard biological problem. Uh, we've made available certain awards um, that you're seeing here for maximizing target discovery aid and model performance. And we've provided a starter repository for um, the community to essentially get started on this problem and try to develop their own uh, approaches um, addressing this uh, discovery issue. And I'm, I'm, I'm very um, uh, much looking forward to um, the potential results that are coming out of this um, over the next month. And we will be reporting uh, the results of this um, at the end of the uh, at the end of April um, at the ArcClear conference um, happening uh, virtually. And uh, I would jump over this just for time's sake, uh, but I would also like to refer you to the machine learning and drug discovery workshop um, that we're conducting at the end of April uh, with some of the leading faces um, for machine learning and drug discovery, and we'll also be announcing the winners of the Gene Disco Challenge there. And now I would like to take a step back in terms of what the potential impact um, of this methodology could be. And so if you look at across the industry, uh, roughly 8,000 potential treatments that are currently in preclinical development across pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry, um, we're seeing that a potential improvement of the probability of success from the current 5% to just 6%, so just 1% more, could potentially lead to a discovery of 80 additional potential life-changing medicines for patients, which is an increase of almost 20%. And really it shows you the stark impact that um, these methodologies could have on improving uh, health and well-being uh, across uh, society. And so it's not just playing, uh, artificial intelligence machine is not just playing an integral role in decoding the complexity of biology, but really in the long term could have a significant impact on enabling people to live better, healthier, and longer lives. And that's ultimately the mission that we're trying uh, to solve for. And that's why we're discovering, um, trying to build these algorithms and methods um, that discover new medicines um, faster than, than we have in the past. So thank you so much for your attention, and I would be very um, eager and keen to take your questions. Yeah, th thank you very much, Patrick, and also for holding over the technical issues. Uh, I don't know how the logistics of taking question would look like. Uh, we could certainly give it a try. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's see if you are able to hear it. Otherwise, I could sort of uh, repeat the question for you if I'm able to understand it. Yep. So, uh, is yes, there sir. any question for uh, Patrick, one or two? So yeah, Patrick, really uh, thankful for your time. And if you are on the on the app, on the event app, uh, I suggest uh, you know people could sort of engage with you and sort of take the conversation offline. Thank you so much, and and uh, uh, yeah, look forward to speaking again.